Now I've got a chill. Um, okay, that's debunking economics. The next book I'm uh, publishing is in, in April. It's already written. Is one of the one of the real problems about time lags and publishing. Uh, two of the countries I said would go into a recession have already started having recession symptoms. And it's going to come out about when about eight of them are in that situation. I'll be told that I, I published too late. We'll have to wait and see. But the general thing I'd like right to say about how one would teach economics now that we know we really have to teach something other than just neoclassical economics is first of all teach it warts and all. Uh, teach every school and. Don't just stick to a nice sanitised version in textbooks, but go back and read to the originals as well, which are much more informative, normally much better written as well. Uh, don't get economists teaching mathematics and computing. They don't know enough about either to do either justice. Learn it from computing and mathematics departments, not from economists. <laughs> Teach the facts. You mentioned how many of your courses are fact-free. I mean, one of my favourite books in the front is Hal Varian's Microeconomic Analysis, which I had to suffer through in doing my Masters and PhD. There is not one empirical datum in the whole bloody book. Not a, not a single fact in the whole damn book. It's all theory. Uh, it's all neoclassical theory. Uh, when you bring in the actual facts in the real world, you find they contradict a lot of the things which you're taught in the course. But for example, the money multiplier, that's simply impossible. It, it violates the rules of accounting. If accountants run banks, then they can't use the money multiplier. I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen. If you look at the real business cycle and the idea that unemployment was voluntary during the real business, during the Great Depression, nobody was volunteering to stand in soup kitchens, either serving them out or, or, eat, or eating the soup. Facts, facts just chuck some things right out the window. And again, on the other side of politics, the, the faith that a lot of Marxists still have in places like Cuba and didn't have in Russia and so on, it's just a religious obsession. Let the facts speak for themselves. It didn't work. If that's your best alternative, you've got to come up with something better than that again. And learn the history of economics and economic history as well. Again, this has, again, been driven out of departments. I sat in my own department of economics in, in the University of New South Wales in 1988 as the historians pleaded to be allowed to move out of the economics faculty into the arts faculty because they, th they thought they were threatened with extinction. They were refused to leave, and, yes, they were made extinct as well. And also, we should learn one thing is that you don't have in any of your courses here, the complex systems approach to dynamic modelling, which mathematicians and engineers have been developing for the last half century. Economists almost completely passed it by. There's an excellent free resource there on the web called chaosbook.org if you need to know the absolute, from the basics to the absolute pinnacle of the theory. It's all sitting there. And so learn all these other things. Don't learn from economists. They don't know about maths, maths, maths to teach maths properly. They certainly don't know enough computing to teach computing properly. And take a look at also some of the areas which are evolving in other disciplines as well that are filling the vacant space left by all the things economists don't cover. One of these things being called cleodynamics, which a guy called Peter Turchin is playing a fairly heavy role in. And that's doing the sort of qualitative differential equation approach to modelling that I, I like doing. I think it's what economists should always have been doing. So a lot of the good developments are going to come from outside economics and there's nothing unusual about that uh, in terms of when you see intellectual change take place in a discipline. And where you don't get the freedom you need inside your own universities, use the web. I want to try to create some resources on the web myself that will make it possible to learn economics better than we currently teach it. Now, teaching honestly is absolutely essential because when you look at what economics textbooks have taught you, you know, there's the theory and there's the textbook. And to make it sexually equal, there's the theory and there's the textbook. Okay? It's just totally airbrushed nonsense. Uh, if you read the originals, you'll see the flaws yourself much more clearly. So, for example, one uh, lunatic idea that got a bit of credence in economics for some time was this idea of Ricardian equivalence, and that's what gave us the idea of expansion of fiscal, fiscal authority and other pieces of claptrap like that. Now, when you take a look in the textbooks, this is a particular textbook uh, excerpt from not one of the worst textbooks, but this says uh, a special type of crowding out if we hold government spending constant through time. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> then a tax cut today must be matched by a tax increase in the future. Now imagine, one of my students always said a better word there is pretend, that people are patient and very forward-looking. These forward-looking people will, will mean, you know that high taxes mean fewer taxes. High taxes, uh, high spending now means high taxes in the future, so they'll save and therefore cancel out. Look pretty stupid there in its own right. But read the original, it's even more idiotic. So here's, when you read the original article, and he starts with the word suppose now, in other words pretend, that household demands depends upon expected present value of taxes. So every time you go shopping, you're thinking about the taxes you have to pay until you die. Yeah, sure. Uh, then he says, I'll discuss five major theoretical objections to it, the first of which is that people don't live forever. Well, duh. 
uh, and hence don't care about taxes that are levied after their death. He says, well, that fails if the typical person is giving to children out of altruism, you know, altruistic families like the Trumps. Um, so the main idea is a network of intergenerational transfers makes the typical person, this is the typical person, if these are the people who don't kill each other in America, a part of an extended family that goes on indefinitely. In this setting, households capitalise the entire array of expected future taxes and thereby plan effectively with an infinite horizon. Now, I've only got one reaction to that. Okay? And frankly, do you really need an Australian to tell you that's bullshit? Okay? It's obviously bullshit. The fact that it even gets you into the journal in the first place is a sign of the level of ideological delusion that dominates the journals. But of course, you wouldn't know it if you study that same stuff in the textbooks. The absurdity is not as obvious if you don't if you don't read the originals. So go and read the originals. But they don't have time to sugarcoat them. The, the, the sheer nonsense, and that applies to other schools of thought as well, by the way, turn up in the raw texts, avoid the textbooks until such time as we actually have a decent discipline in two or three centuries. Now, things like the Cambridge controversy. Who knows what I'm talking about there? Yeah, okay. That's about the same. I asked the same question back when it was happening. I've got much the same answer because they never made it into the textbooks. And when you do look at them, if they ever, ever mention them at all, they imply the neoclassicals won. Now, Paul Samuelson conceded defeat. That is not somebody winning from the neoclassical side of, of, the, of that particular dispute. Who's heard of the Sonnenschein and Mandrel de Berth theorem? A few more. Okay. Now, when you look at that, it's not mentioned at all, or it's mentioned, it's said, as special conditions that are necessary to be able to aggregate individual demand curves and get market demand curves with the same properties. It's a proof by contradiction that that can't apply if individuals differ and goods differ. As soon as you have that, the only way to get around the condition and get to drive market demand curves from individual demand curves and have them slowed down is that individuals are all the same and so are commodities. Now, that's a proof by contradiction. You cannot derive a market demand curve that slopes downwards from neoclassical theory. And that's just an honest look at the statement. Show it any mathematician. Show it the, the starting point is and the conclusion. They say proof by contradiction. Clumsy way to go about it, but that's what it is. Uh, we have um, tons of empirical data that firms do not have rising marginal cost. What do all the textbooks here assume? Rising marginal cost. That's why you won't find facts in those section in the textbook, because the facts flatly contradict what the theory tells you. So it's completely ignored by textbooks, and instead you get this childish junk like you'll find in ManQ, where the model of a typical firm is a kid with a lemonade stand somewhere on the street with the rising cost of making lemonades is reduced small. Now, that's not to say the neoclassical is the only centres on this front. If you take a look at Marxists, for example, they're still inventing excuses to keep the labour theory of value alive. I just have to put up with Andrew Kleinman occasionally on this front. It's wrong. Get over it. Okay, It's internally inconsistent. It, it defies the laws of thermodynamics as well, which is something I'm working on writing about right now. If you're not going to if you, if you still don't believe it's not wrong, at least teach that some people think it's wrong. So again, it isn't just the neoclassicals who try to preserve their side and avoid the fundamental criticisms. You have to admit shortcomings as well. So post-Keynesians are pretty weak on ecological issues. They're aware of that, but it's a major area they've got to work on. And they've yet to develop a completely coherent methodology. They still talk about horses for courses when I think they really should have a unifying theory of value in the same way the neoclassicals have, but not one that is as flawed. And admit the strengths that other schools as well have. So a lot of Austrians try to co-opt me into Austrian thought because they find a lot of what I talk about being similar to their interests and uncertainty and expectations on entrepreneurship. Yeah, I admire that stuff. I think we should say that they have some good insights there. I don't think the theory of value makes any sense. I think they're totally naive about money <coughs> and about uh, but they still believe they're so close to equilibrium they can still take that as the rule. But admit there are strengths and other approaches as well. And above all, teach that economists have a right to disagree with each other. I remember the wonderful uh, jousting you were involved What was that guy's name again? Uh, Professor Gautier. Okay, okay. I mean, the body squirming he was doing is he started saying that there's 99% you know, of economists in neoclassical and 1% belong to all the other 16 schools, I think he named. And he said they've got, you know, they're like creationists or like climate change deniers. They've got their own journals, but they don't want to have peer review, yada, yada, yada. Um, interestingly, there's empirical data to contradict your starting point, by the way, because in France, you may know that France has a very top-down university system. You have to be registered as a particular type of academic to be an economist or a mathematician and so on. So there are 1,800 academic economists in France. And when there was a call to form a pluralist association, which was scuttled, unfortunately, by one of the last French Nobel Prize winners, 
Before it was scuttled, 300 of those 1,800 put their hands up to say they wanted to be the head part of the heterodox group. That's one-sixth. Okay, it's not 99% that are the majority. There's 17% or so that are the minority schools, one in six. That's actually bigger than I would have thought, particularly being brave enough to put your hands up in that situation when you know it might also single you out for criticism later. So there's a much wider range of disagreement than neoclassicals expect the belief there is, and no school's perfect. They can all learn from each other to some degree. So what we do at Kingston is I teach the introductory course called being a becoming an economist. And what it starts with is a section I call Why Economists Disagree. And that has lectures covering the methodologies of, of science in general and major schools of thought, the neoclassical, Austrian, post-Keynesian, and I talk about ecological issues as well where I think all schools fall over. And I then emphasise the questions that define each of those schools. So when you look at them, each question is valid in its own right. There's no intrinsic reason why you'd rule out any of these questions as a starting point for analysing capitalism. But once you've chosen that question, it tends to rule out other questions. And that's, again, one of the reasons why a range of perspectives makes sense in economics. And in this discussion, facts matter too. There are some facts which support some schools and undermine others. They are, facts are not theory neutral. So I want to teach when facts are simply, frankly, wrong. Now, the neoclassicals have this thing called loanable funds as the model of what banks do. And the money multiplier is a model of how money is created. And thank God for the Bank of England on this front because they came out with a beautiful paper on their own volition. I had no idea it was coming out until I saw it, though I knew some of the authors before it was published, called Money Creation in the Modern Economy. And they start with this very low-key statement, money creation in practice differs from some popular misconceptions. Banks do not act as simple intermediaries, lending out deposits to save as placement. That's not what they do. Nor do they multiply up central bank reserves to create new loans. Now, to give you a bit of a picture on, on that, if you imagine what the neoclassicals teach is the way that banks operate as intermediaries, then the reserve, the assets of the bank play no role in this. It's where just where the reserves are stored. Uh, and the saver and the lender negotiate off, off the balance sheet of the bank to arrange a loan, and then the, lender, then the, the saver lends to the borrower, the borrower repays, and the borrower pays interest back again. By the way, the direction of signs are positive to negative I use in Minsky the same convention that electricians use that flows from positive to negative, uh, even though we know electrons are negative and flowing in the opposite direction. It's a convention to make it clear what's going on there. So I treat assets as positives, liabilities and equity as negatives, and flows are from positive to negative. That's how you'd show the vision that the neoclassicals have. And when I put that into my Minsky software, that's one reason I wanted to bring my own computer here. Let's just take a look at that model in Minsky. So this is taking Krugman and, and uh, Eggerson's model of loanable funds where the consumer sector lends to the investment sector and then the investment sector repays interest to the consumer sector and then the, uh, investments, the consumer sector pays a fee to the banking sector to pay for the, you know, basically, I, I describe banks in the neoclassical model a bit like the Ashley Madison uh, style of having sex. They don't actually screw you, but they introduce you to somebody else who wants to screw you. Okay. <laughs> Good line to use in Amsterdam. Uh, so if I simulate this model, then you find that, first of all, growth is zero. You can see the top uh, left-hand graph there is the growth rate. GDP is flatlining at 200. Nothing's happening at the velocity of money because there's no circulation going on at this stage. Now, if I increase the rate of spending, notice the growth Debt, the debt level rises, the debt to GDP ratio has risen down the bottom. Growth actually fell a bit because the person who's lending actually has a higher <coughs> propensity to consume. If I now accelerate the repayment, so repayment takes, sorry, repayment takes a lot longer, you can see the debt ratio has gone up like crazy. Bugger all's happened to the growth level in GDP. If you then have a dramatic speed up in how fast people repay loans, growth actually speeds up. And if lending takes much longer, so debt levels fall, growth again rises very temporarily, but you go back to where you were before. Now, those are dramatic changes in the level of debt in this proto-economy and the rate of, uh, rate of lending and so on, and pretty trivial changes to what's happening in GDP. So if this was structurally true, you could ignore the banking sector. So I'm just going to stop that simulation of having shown you that range and go back and show you what it looks like from the point of view of what actually happens which is rather than being Ashley Madison, it's a bit like the red light district, okay, they supply. And in this case, the, the bank gives you a loan, which means it increases its assets and that increases its liabilities as well. That's why the negative increases over there. When you repay, the assets goes down, the liabilities fall as well, and you pay money across 
to the to the borrower, for the borrower pays money to the bank rather than to the so-called saver who plays no role role in it whatsoever. And I can make those changes in Minsky very quickly. I hope I don't make a mistake doing it, which is why I've got a, a backup of the other model there. So I can delete the column that says the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. And I can then delete the lending, repayment, interest payment, and bank fee operations from the, from the balance sheet of the consumer sector. Bring up the banking sector and say, well, let's now show that the loan is actually an asset of the banking sector. So I'll just make the screen a bit wider here, show the operations a bit more easily. So if I now say, let's add a new asset, and then what, asset, what liabilities are in the system and therefore it exist as an asset you can allocate to somebody else. I can now bring in that there's now the loan, lending and repayment is now from the bank to the non-bank. Interest payments go from the investment sector to the banking sector. The bank fee is a fiction, let's delete it. There's more changes I need to make to make it completely correct. Well, let's now reset this thing. And you see now you've got positive growth straight away. The rising level of debt is creating more money as well and more demand. If I speed up lending, which remember it actually reduced economic growth last time, now it increases it. Did I, if I slow down repayments, people take longer to repay loans, they're using the money for longer, you get an acceleration in growth. And then if you have people decide to repay money more quickly and lend the banks lend more slowly, the growth rate plunges, you can actually go to negative growth. That's the real world we live in. The models are otherwise identical. All I've done is change the thing, who lends, is it the bank who lends or is the bank just an intermediary? In the real world, the bank's the intermediary, and that is a fact that crucifies neoclassical theory of banking, throws it out. Okay? So in a lot of ways, you can get rid of some of the nonsense we've been putting up just by teaching what the real facts are. Now, the actual cost structure of firms, they're one of my favourites. Alan Blinder wrote this book in 1998. He had a bunch of PhD students he sent to corporations that represented 15% of America's GDP. We're not talking a small sample here. He asked them what their cost structures were. And this is chapter four in the book. Wouldn't it be nice to know the factual basis of theories of price stickiness? And that lovely quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, it's a capital mistake to theorise before one has data. That almost defines economic theory. And he said, looking at it, the overwhelmingly bad news for economic theory is that only 11% of GDP is produced under conditions of rising marginal cost. Many more companies state they have falling rather than rising marginal cost curves. He said their answers paint an image of the cost structure of a typical firm that is very different from the one immortalised in textbooks. Now, it's not a new painting. There is one review of this book on Amazon. There's 110 of Mas Kalel. Guess who wrote the one review of Alan Blinder? Me. Okay? I think we're the only person who read the factual data. The rest of them read this theoretical nonsense. Now, it's, you go back in history, you find back in the 1950s, the real motives, motives, opera, uh, motive for Friedman to write his anti-factual uh, methodology paper was this work by Eichmann and Guthrie that surveyed manufacturing firms and asked them, what's your cost structure? Now, I gave them a set of eight diagrams to choose from, as well as textual explanations. Which one of those looks like a typical textbook example? Two? Three. Okay, correct? Three is a typical textbook. One of the 334 firms chose that as it's describing its costs. What about Channel 7? Does that look like anything you've seen in a textbook? That's the real world. 202, 103 of the 334 firms chose that cost structure. That's how different the real world is to the theory you get taught in neoclassical textbooks. It's about time the theory is thrown out. Regardless of its theoretical errors, which it has as well, it's simply factually incorrect. So that's the background. Teach the facts, teach the honest need to disagree with each other, but also teach the questions that different schools ask. So most of you should be able to work out who, which, which schools this, this applies to. But I show this to a bunch of school kids, they wouldn't have a clue. And that's part of the difficulty we face in trying to teach economics differently. Can the economy equate demand and supply in every market? What does it sound like to you? Neoclassical? Please? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't be shy. Okay. How does innovation and change occur? Any guesses? Austrian. Okay. How did capitalism evolve and will it turn into something else? That's a mild way of putting Marxism forward. <laughs> what caused the Great Depression and can it happen again? Post-Keynesian, Hyman Minsky. How does the economy produce more outputs and inputs and what does that have to do with environmental economics? How do real people behave in economic situations? Behavioural economics. 
how do relations between the sexes affect economics? Feminist. Can we understand the economy using tools of physics? Econophysics. They're all valid questions. The fact that only one question is allowed shows how narrow the discipline has become. Now, the trouble is for teaching this to high school students, all they've really learned is economics or physics or math or history. They haven't learned there's any questions about how you should do that. It's just what they do in the textbooks. And that's the real barrier we face, the major barrier. We try to teach this to people straight out of school and try to actually encourage them to come to us rather than any other university. So you look at, you know, how can people look at something like the sky and see such two very different models? On the left-hand side, you have Ptolemy's vision of how the planets must move in the aggregate around the Earth. And the other, you've got, uh, you've got uh, the Copernican vision. Exactly the same thing, seen in totally different ways. And facts matter, because when you hear modern astronomers talking about Ptolemy's system, they say it made beautifully accurate predictions, but it was just wrong. In other words, the fact that you can predict something doesn't mean you understand it. And that actually rules out Milton Friedman's little rule on, on methodology anyway, even though on that front he fails and the, the post-Kansians win. So accurate prediction isn't enough. You've got to get understand, you've got to get the structure right. And that leads to a large amount of teaching about the actual structure of the economy as well. So we have a parallel course called Capitalism, which covers economic history and the history of economic thought. And they're both live subjects. So Fukuyama wrote about the end of history, or a bit like Mark Twain's <laughs> death at the time. It's greatly exaggerated, as Fukuyama himself is now embarrassingly admitting. And economy, economics itself is undergoing rapid evolution. If you go look at what Lucas wrote just about 13 years ago, that sent the central problem of preventing depressions has been solved for many decades and come to Kosha Lakota today, simply we, we do not have a settled model of the macro economy, realising just how out in the open sea economic theory is. The choices they made decades ago shouldn't be stuck with because they cut off, they cut off the paths to understand what we're trying to understand, which is the macro economy. Uh, now, we go on to other courses after the first year, economic modelling and macroeconomics, and we teach both mainly neoclassical or post-Keynesian views on the same subject, which gets a bit challenging for students on some occasions. And we also introduce the essential techniques you need to do genuine dynamics, not they're just not DSG, which I don't regard as either dynamic or general. The things like the basic of dynamic systems, including how you work out stability and instability of linear and nonlinear systems, system dynamics, which I teach, clear metrics, which I'll be teaching next year as well, the essentials of monthly agent modelling. We have a couple of great people on staff who know that area very well. And we're going to be starting a new degree for undergraduates in the next, uh, next ac ac academic year, which is an economics and computing combined major, which will be half economics and half computing over three years, more computing to begin with, more economics towards the end. Again, because economists aren't competent to teach the basics of computing, I include myself in that. I know a lot more about computing than most economists that know are near enough to teach computing properly. Um, and the courses themselves aren't enough, by the way. If you really want to learn the stuff, you've got to put in the midnight hours yourselves. There's lots of literature to read, lots of support areas you need to learn. You can't be taught in a course itself. So the really interested students need to read outside, which is part of why you become academics and intellectuals anyway. Now, given all that, that's the positive side, but... There's a real challenge to the viability of any non-mainstream course because, for a start, we're suppressed at the major universities. The Oxfords, the Cambridges, the Princetons either don't allow or drive out anybody or marginalise anybody who converts to a non-orthodox stream during their career. So we survive at the lowly ranked universities like Kingston in England or UMKC over in America. We have less funding, less academic freedom and more bureaucracy, as I prefer to call it. Uh, and we're vulnerable to what are called market-based reforms of education done by people who have suffered under a, a PPE degree and think they understand the economy. So the Australian government removed the caps on student numbers that controlled how many humanities places could be offered at various universities in 2012. In that one year, we went from 120 preliminary enrolments to 16. Okay. That's what shut us go. We do, as well as having a bunch of moronic managers as well, that also helped. But that's what screwed my, my university course in, in Australia. Now the same things happen in England. And what's happened there across the board, our Kingston's humanities intake is halved. Because the school students are in no position to know what is a good and a bad education in economics. Now they're coming in as virgins, effectively. And we expect them to make educated choices as though they're experienced. I'm sorry they're not. It's going to get worse next year with what's called the teaching evaluation framework where some bozos decided that they could actually award gold, silver and bronze medals for an entire university's teaching staff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's going to make me given a bronze, a bronze medal because I'm at Kingston. Okay. How do you think you can actually rank a university at the upper level for its teaching across all its subjects shows how little they understand 
the diversity of offerings that apply inside most universities and the diversity of teaching. So I'd like to give these people lead models, lead medals, delivered at extremely high speed. So the existential challenges well include what happens in journals. Because neoclassicals are the gatekeepers on the so-called leading journals, we don't get published there. And Blanchard recently came out saying that uh, economics has to be less imperialistic. Uh, editors have to allow for different types of models to do different types of tasks, which is a good thing. But they're still incredibly resistant to non-paradigm papers. So in 2013... I submitted a paper to the American Economic Review Macro, and the editor rejected my paper without refereeing it, but he made the mistake of engaging in an escape debate with me. And at one stage, he actually came out with this line. Can you believe it? But what if they get more information about the future? How brainwashed do you have to believe it to be to believe there's such a thing as information about the future? Okay? Unless I'm wearing levitating... You know, boots back here, there ain't no such thing. But that's the extent to which they've been caught up on the idea you can have, you know, predict forward the future. So they'll continue excluding non-paradigm non papers and that'll make promotion difficult for non-neoclassical staff. And even the, in general, the funding bodies just remain hostile for pluralism <laughs> because of that gatekeeping effect I mentioned earlier. So pressure has to come from students and the public to change the economics. It's still vital to have that. And uh, I'm going to continue my pressuring as well. So the next book I'm writing is this one little here, coming out in uh, April of 2017. Uh, and I'm going to be trying to get a bit of a campaign for the public to help support doing further work like that. And if you want to come to a master's degree that gives you a bit more exposure to more than just neoclassical economics, come to Kingston. Thank you. Thank you.